My name is Mario Vitale, and this is Molto Mario. I'm here with my good friends Ken, Christy, and Michael, and today we're talking about the basic pasta sauce primer. You've seen me talk about this in a thousand shows over the years, forever. Basically, what it comes down to it, these are the building blocks to make great pasta dishes. They're very simple, they're very accessible, and they're pretty much throughout the entire entire peninsula of the Italian culture, as it to say. And what it means is that everywhere there's going to be a simple basic sauce, everywhere there's going to be a ragu or a meat sauce, and everywhere that they ever make any baked pastas, there's going to be a bechamel sauce. So we're going to make those three sauces today, and then I'm going to show you how to quickly combine them with either one noodle or another. And we'll talk a little bit about the specificity of the noodle to the condiment choice. Now, the most important thing to realize is that it's all very easy. Whenever I talk and wax, and you'll see me talk for a half hour while I cut up one onion, it's all because it's so simple that there's really not that much real action to do. And when you're talking about Italian cooking, we're not talking about really kind of making a hero or deifying some fancy guy with a really tall hat who's got a degree in chemistry. We're talking about the cooking of grandmas. And if we can talk and, and manifest that in our cooking, then in fact, we're going to really understand the matriarchal portion of what Italian cooking is all about. And it's all about that hospitality. It's all about the simplicity. And most importantly, it's about the satisfaction that you get from a dish of something as simple as pasta. Now, we're going to make our basic tomato sauce that I've probably referred to more than 300,000 times over time. And it's very simple. We're going to take onions, and this is a Spanish onion. It could just as easily be a red onion. It's probably not going to be a leek or a scallion, but it could be a shallot. And we're going to use extra virgin olive oil and put it in a relatively hot pan and start to caramelize it. Now, when we talk about caramelization, what do we mean? We mean that the natural sugar or starch in something is going to actually come out and transform itself into something even sweeter. And the way that you do that is by adding direct heat to it. And we're using a lip, the lipid of choice in my favorite sauce, the basic tomato sauce, is going to be extra virgin olive oil. As you get further north, you'll discover that they're going to use butter. As you get even further north than that, they're going to use lard. But basically, it starts at the top near the Austro-Hungarian em em Empire, and that's the lard belt. It's where emerald lives up there in the lard world. <laughs> then you come down, and then there's butter, and there's hun tons and tons and tons of cattle cow's milk cheeses, blah, 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 blah. Then you get down to Emilio Romagna where it starts to get a little gray. And then below that, from Tuscany on south, pretty much the lipid of choice is extra virgin olive oil or olive oil in any one of its thousand of ways of serving it. Now we're going to take some garlic. And when I use garlic, I thinly slice it. That is to say, if you wanted to pick it out, you could. But you probably don't have to. And I'm just going to throw that in there. Now, the, the order that this all goes in here isn't that relevant, but the most important thing to realize is that before you get your tomatoes in there, you do not want to be throwing them on top of raw onions. So you want the onions and the garlic and a little bit of this carrot to actually be already cooked. So you, what we're going to do peel is... peel the carrots? You need to peel them like those are? You don't have to peel carrots, and if you get organic carrots, it's probably even better just to wash them because there's going to be a certain amount of... Uh, fiber and texture and sweetness in the skin itself, but often enough they're even a little bit bitter, the skin. So if you peel them, you're going to be do better. You could grate it like this, which is what you want to do. And I don't know if you, any of you ever saw my very first show back in 1994, but while I was doing this for my very first show, all of a sudden I grated my finger. It was, uh, <laughs> wasn't really a bloody mess. I pretty much covered it up as good as I can, but if people still ever get a chance to see that show, you can see me at one of my most embarrassing moments. <laughs> Mario, what about cooking without garlic? What about, what if someone in your family doesn't like garlic or is allergic to it, doesn't like the taste of it? Then it's very easy to delete. One of the things that when you start to remove the components of something that's not, that when there's only four or five components, you remove 20% of the ingredients. It's not a bad thing. It won't just have that same kind of taste. But garlic is probably the one, and onions are, is probably the other, the one of which people are most afraid of. And if they don't like it, by all means. Just delete it. It's not going to make that big of a deal. You may have to overcompensate. I mean, you may have to compensate later on by adding a little bit more salt or a little bit more seasoning so that it starts to have a little bit more flavor because you've taken out one of the building blocks of it. But certainly, garlic allergy and garlic uncomfortability is something that's really big, and a lot of people in New York have that same kind of an issue. Now, traditionally, when people think of basic tomato sauces, they think tomato basil. And in fact, we're going to add basil at this to the, at the last minute to show you the plethora of variation that you can use it for. But when I talk about using a basic tomato sauce, I love the herb thyme. So what we're going to do is just take a little bit of the thyme. And the way you do that is you just rub your thumb along the stems going either one way up or down and just pinch it off a little bit. And when you're pinching this, you'll notice that all of a sudden that flavor comes out. That's because you're releasing the essential oils 
that are in that that actually give it that flavor. Now, what makes an herb an edible herb? If you think about all of the thousands of plants around us, what, who decided that this one was going to be good, but that a pine tree wasn't going to be good? Well, in fact, you can taste all these things, and when you start to travel around the world, you'll see that although sumac is something that looks just like kind of a decorative thing when you're traveling around the, the Atlantic Northeast, sumac's a huge flavoring in a lot of Turkish and Middle Eastern cooking. We would never think of going over there and eating it, and they would probably never think of picking up rosemary and putting it into their food, because they're like, well, that tastes like a pine tree. So now, how that developed is just over time, people started to like thyme or rosemary or sage <laughs> and basil, but didn't pick out either the angelica, which is now trendy, or other herbs that are now coming along as people are starting to think about it. Now, the next and most important ingredient here is what they call pelati. These are pomodori pelati, or peeled tomatoes. The kind that I like are from in and around Campania. My favorites are San Marsano. However, there are San Marsano varieties of tomato that you can get from anywhere from Iowa to California to Spain and all these other places. So it has to be San Marsano, but also grown in Campania. And most specifically, if you can get those, the kind that are actually grown in the town of, or in the region of San Marsano itself, which is in the shadow of Vesuvius, which probably is why it's so delicious, because of that volcanic soil that happened way, way back in 72 AD. That kind of ground has created a beautiful environment to grow vegetables in. And if you're ever in Naples and you're eating, all of a sudden, just the regular old grilled eggplant and just plain old ordinary sliced tomatoes, those are the things that just drive you wild. And you're just like, I can't believe this tastes so good. Why doesn't it taste like that at home? What well, you, it can, yes? What are you doing with your you're squishing? I'm them. squeezing these because I hate the way that they have a texture when they're processed in a food processor or with one of those little dipstick things. Because I like there still to be a little amount of chunks, but I like it to be relatively random. So now... You can see that we've started to caramelize in the pot here just a little bit around the outside edges. What we're going to do is we're going to add this here. We're going to stir it around and I'm going to add just a touch of salt now. We're going to bring that to a boil. We're going to lower the heat. We're going to simmer it for about 25 minutes. We're going to drop a little spaghetti so I can show you what a beautiful spaghetti with basic tomato sauce tastes like. And when we come back, we'll start to talk about a little ragu bolognese, some bechamel, assemble a little tagliatelle. So please, stay with us. Now we've got our basic tomato sauce. I took out about two-thirds of it because if there's any mistake that American cooks make when they're cooking pasta is that they tend to oversauce it. They put too much stuff on. In Italy, the main event is the noodle and the rest is just the dressing, very much like we dress salads. Now I've got it in there. I'm allowing it to start to soak. What I'm always telling you to do is what I really mean. That is to say, take it out about 30 seconds to 45 seconds before it's the al dente that you want and cook it in the sauce. So the two separate ingredients, the noodle and the sauce, come together as one. <laughs> and that's important to understand, almost as important as it is to just finish it right here in the pan without too much stuff on it. And you can see I've just got this here. And you're going to say, gosh, this is so darn good. It's because I didn't put too much sauce on it. There's just a little basil in here at the end. And you could add cheese here, but you don't need to, because we're talking about the simple building blocks. How did you know how much pasta to cook? That's a good question, Ken. In Italy, they tend to use about 100 grams per person for an appetizer. 100 grams is a little bit more than three ounces. So one of those one-pound packages will serve five people, really, because it's about 454 grams, as it were. And, but in my case, because my hands are exactly the size and shape that they are, this is exactly enough for four people. That must be about 400 grams, but that's because I possess the long, delicate fingers of a pianist as opposed to the short, stubby fingers of a sausage maker. We noticed that. There we go. So go ahead. Here we are, Ken. Just a little bit of uh, noodles and serve them up. Now, the next thing we're going to make are the two kind of components to making a lasagna. The first of which is a bechamel sauce. And this is something that you're going to use to make into any kind of a baked pasta. And what it does is it kind of serves to keep it nice and moist, add a certain amount of richness, and it's absolutely essential in lasagna bolognese, but it could just as easily be any pasticcio of pasta, pasticcio being just anything that's kind of mixed up and served. 
Mario, How are we? Yes. With all the sauces that you're making today, can you freeze them and they'll Absolutely. still be fresh? Absolutely. And the, and that's exactly what I've done with this. We made enough for probably five dinners like this. You just put them in the little quart containers with the tops on them and toss them in the freezer, pull them out the day before you use them, and that will go for the bechamel as it will go for the meat sauce or the ragu bolognese. Now, to make the bechamel, we're going to take five tablespoons of butter and four of flour. The traditional roux is made of equal ports, equal portions or parts, flour and butter. But I've always found that it's a little difficult to work with. I'd like it just a little bit wetter as opposed to a little bit drier. Now, I've got that. I've got my milk, to which I've added absolutely nothing. And I'm going to pour that in, having heated it up. And I'm going to whisk it through to see just how much it'll take. But this is about four cups of milk for four tablespoons of flour. It's better that this is a little thin than a little too thick because I can always use it when it's thin. If it's thick, it'll tend to set up just like a pudding when it's cool or room temperature. And that's no bueno if you're trying to make a lasagna. So we want to have it just a little on the thin side because also it's going to be always a little bit less viscous, I mean more viscous when it's warm than it is when it's cool. And when you're assembling a lasagna, often enough, this is actually room temperature or cool. So now what you want to do when you've made your bechamel is we like to season it with just a little bit of nutmeg but you can also just season it with a little bit of salt and we're going to turn the heat way down and just allow it to kind of cook and in this cooking what you're doing is removing some of that cakey flourly taste and you want to make sure that you cook it for at least 15 or 20 minutes so that that gets out. Now the next component is going to be the world famous meat sauce of Bologna or ragu bolognese and what we're going to do is we're going to take some carrots some onions and some celery and because we want these to almost disappear into the sauce I'm going to cut these up into pieces that are very very small because effectively this is going to become part of the texture or the thickening of this sauce now traditionally when we're in Emilia Romagna and we're making this sauce we're using three meats pork veal and beef but you could just as easily use just one of those if you wanted to make a beef ragu or a veal ragu or a pork ragu you could do that in this case instead of just plain pork or pork sausage we're just going to use finely ground pancetta which is the seasoned pork belly or the bacon of Italy now the trick to this dish is we're actually going to use two lipids lipid of course being the fat we're going to take about five tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil and three tablespoons of butter and we're gonna cook these guys here in that until they're completely softened we're not looking to add color here we don't want these to become deep dark caramelized and golden brown we're looking more to sweat those so what may happen is we'd actually put a top on it or just turn the heat down but actually by adding this much stuff to it it's going to slow it way down and the most important thing at this point is to get it stirred around. Now, <clears throat> we're going to sweat this for probably 10 to 15 minutes until it's nice and soft. If it started to go too quickly, by all means, you would just take a little bit of water like that and just splash it in. Because again, we really don't want this to become colored. When we come back, I'm going to show you how we make the basic pasta for this. We're going to finish up our ragu, and I'll show you how to bring two of these things together in a magnificent, simple plate of tagliatelle al ragu. So please, stay with us. Welcome back. Now our little dadolato, or our mirepoix as it would be called, or our sofrito as it would be called in Italian, has now completely softened. And at this point, it's just a question of simplicity. We're going to take our ground beef, we're going to take our ground veal, and we're going to take our ground pancetta. And this is what pancetta looks like. It's this little wheel. Sometimes you'll get what's called pancetta stesa, which looks like slab bacon. But it's effectively the same thing. It's a salted pork belly that has a little bit of spices on it. And what we're going to do is we're going to stir that through, just like so. And then we're going to think about the rest of the ingredients that go there. I'm going to let this start to sweat just a little bit. But the other things that go in the classic ragu bolognese, and not necessarily in all meat sauces. A lot of times this would be enough. A lot of times if they were in a region that just had pigs, they would just use pork. Or if they just had water buffalo, they would just use water buffalo. Whatever it was, they would use what was ever local and easily available to them because that's how these traditions have started. It's by using whatever was around you. The other ingredients that we're going to use is tomato paste, milk, and white wine, which always throws people because the lactic component 
of this particular sauce is what makes it so unctuous when it comes. Now, what is this sauce traditionally served with when we talk about two kinds of pasta? There's the dried pasta, that is to say made with the hard wheat of the south, and then there's the fresh pasta, although every part, every region of Italian culture has a fresh pasta as a kind of a holiday thing. The main one comes from Emilia Romagna, and they use the soft wheat, that wheat which grows on the plains in and around Emilia Romagna, with just eggs. And the trick here is obviously we use the well method. You've seen me do it a thousand times. They also call it the fountain method in Italy. And what you do is you just get the eggs in there. And the traditional recipe is three and a half cups of flour to four eggs. It's always better to have a little less flour than a little too much flour. Ooh, careful. Does it really make a difference doing it that way instead of in a bowl? Word well, this that. is the way they do it in Italy, Ken. If we'd like to do it the way you do it at your house, it'll be the Molto Ken show. No, it, it, you know, it actually doesn't. Idea. It doesn't really make that much of a difference. But the idea, that what we try to, try to understand here on this show, is the way that they really do it in Italy. And, and although you could probably just put this in a mixer, this is the way they really do it. And it's, it actually, you kind of get into the, the traditional way, and it's funner that way. So what you want to do is start by working the fork around, like so, and then just splash this stuff in here. You get your watch a little higher on your wrist, and then you bring it all together, and you just start working with this stuff. And in the kneading process, you'll understand, you'll start to feel how it starts to come together. And that's a good thing. And what you really want to do is work it and work it and work it to eventually develop this concept called gluten. Now, soft wheat has a little bit less gluten than hard wheat. But in working it, you can develop that gluten. And what that does is it gives it the elasticity that's eventually going to become that al dente-ness in the chew. Now, there's nothing compared to the al dente-ness of a, of a hard pasta. This is the one that you guys just had. It had that almost caviar crunch mm -hmm. to it. Yeah. This will never have that amount of chew to it. But it'll have a certain kind of splendid bite to it. And that's why we, that's developed in this way by actually kneading it. Now we bring this whole dough together, and I always use a little bit yes, a little bit less flour than is called for, and the whole thing starts to come together, and you give it a little pinch, and a little pinch, and then pretty soon you have a dough ball. And from the from the ashes or from that mess, you'll see that some of these dry pieces are coming apart. That's all right. Now I'm going to leave that for a second because now we've got our meat that started to actually brown a little bit here. And now we're going to add tomato paste, and I'm going to add... Why from a tube instead of from a can? I find that the, it's, it's basically the same product, and a tube's easier to use. You don't have to open the can, and when you're done with it, you just put the little top on it, and you put it away, and you can use it again, because I rarely use a whole can of tomato paste, and I love the way tomato paste tastes. So now I've got my tomato paste. I'm going to add a cup of milk, and I'm going to add a cup of wine. Notice, no canned tomatoes, no basil, no herbs. This is something that never really comes out to be a deep red sauce. Ragu bolognese is almost like a pinkish brown, like the, the tigelli or the tiles on the ceilings and on the roofs of all the houses in Bologna. When you talk about Bologna, we refer to it as three things. Bologna the Red, because it was an original communist place. Bologna la Dota, because it was the first university in all of Europe. And Bologna la Grassa, the fat one because it's traditional for using all these rich, delicious flavors. Now, I'm going to bring that up to a boil. I'm going to season it with just a little bit of salt here, and I'm going to turn it down to just a simmer. Now, this stuff, having kneaded it for a little while, would eventually become this stuff. And in the interest of expediency, I'm going to show you how we can make perfect, simple tagliatelle, the kind that we're going to serve with our ragu, using this amazing little tool. And although traditionally, the way that they would make this pasta would be to roll it out between a metal dowel or a metal rolling pin and a wooden board because they want that kind of toothsome texture. The Emiliani are crazy and they think, and they know, I mean this is actually true, that if you roll it between wood and wood, you get something that adheres to the sauce a little bit better as opposed between the metal dowels like this right here, which is going to make it a little bit more what we call liscio or smooth. So when you go out to a traditional Italian meal in Emilia, you're hoping that the grandmother or the wife or the mom or even the dad or the cousin is actually rolling it out between those two wooden pieces. But in my world, I like to actually make this a little bit easier for us to do. So I'm going to roll it through this. And what you'll do is you'll consistently make this rolled and rolled and rolled. And I do it twice through here because as we run it through here, we're even kneading it just a little bit more, developing that gluten just a little bit further and giving it that beautiful chew that we're hoping for. 
and we'll keep rolling this through. When I come back, I'll show you how we've actually created the lasagna, how we've used this ragu bolognese, and I'll have made an entire plate of these tagliatelle so we can see how it's going to taste with the beautiful meat ragu. So please, stay with us. Welcome back. Now, I just made that fresh pasta. We ran it through this machine, and in fact, you roll it into the sheets, you dust it with a little flour, you let it rest for a second, and at this point, this is fresh pasta that will cook in 30 seconds because we haven't allowed it to dry. We haven't messed with it too much. We're putting it in plenty of boiling salted water. And then what I have here is something we made with that ragu bolognese and green noodles. And effectively, when you make a lasagna like we did, we don't use this one here. We use those noodles that I just made the fresh one. We've infused them with a little bit of spinach. And we just roll out those big sheets and then blanch them and then layer them with this bechamel, with this ragu, and a little bit of Parmigiano Reggiano. And then we bake the whole thing and then you allow it to be served at basically room temperature. This isn't something that comes out of the oven, gets cut and brought to the table because then it would just kind of ooze out and look kind of like noodles in sauce. But when you served it just right, that is to say at room temperature with a little bit of Parmesan and the bechamel on top, that's what makes it so good. Now, I've made enough ragu here, obviously, for a couple of weeks. And what I want to do is just use a little bit to dress these fresh noodles that I just made. So I've cooked them. And that's the chef clock saying, yes, that's been about 30 seconds. And we drain it like that. And then it goes straight in there. And we lose the spaghetti from the first part. Then we take a little bit of the indisputed king of cheeses and grate it over the top. And now I took those noodles out in just the right amount of time. Then what I'm going to do with this cheese is create just another little bit of a texture. And then to take it to the plate, you just toss it like this. And the noodles get dressed just perfectly. And notice there's not too much ragu here. It's really all about the noodle. But that's our basic pasta sauce primer. Thanks for being here, guys. I hope to see you all on the next Molto Mario.